And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Julia Bryan and I'm the chair of Democrats Abroad. I'm joined by Amanda Mohar, who's our comms director, and Katie Solon, who's the former chair of Democrats Abroad, as well as our special guest, Senator Michael Bennett. As many of you know, Democrats Abroad will run a global presidential primary next year. Democrats outside the US will have the chance to vote at over 100 voting centers worldwide and through remote voting too. Wherever you are, you'll have the chance to, to join in and cast your vote for the Democratic presidential candidate of your choice. To make sure voters abroad have the chance to get to know the, the presidential candidates, we've reached out to each campaign team, asking them to join us in a global town hall so that you can hear from them directly. This also gives the candidates the chance to learn more about the issues that motor, matter most to you and to the millions of Americans living outside the United States. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Senator. Born in New Delhi, India to a State Department family, Michael Bennett grew up in Washington, DC. He went to school on the East Coast, worked in law, and then he headed West. He spent a few years in the business world before going into the public se sector, where he worked as Chief of Staff for John Hickenlooper before becoming the Superintendent of Denver Public Schools. In 2009, he was appointed to the seat of Colorado Senator when Ken Salazar became Secretary of the Interior. He then successfully ran for the same seat in 2010 and is currently the senior senator from Colorado. He lives in Denver with his wife, Susan Daggett, and their three daughters, Caroline, Helena, and Anne. Unfortunately, the senator won't have time to take questions from the floor, but we'll be sure to share all of the questions and responses that you post with the senator's campaign team. Senator Bennett, are you ready to take it away? I'm ready. Can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Shall I start? So I just want to thank all of you for organizing this, Julia, Amanda, and Katie for putting it together and everything that you're doing to make sure that the Democrats abroad are able to participate uh, in this election. I uh, tell every, every audience I go that if you don't, if you want to just remember one thing that I say while I'm here, it's that we got to get everybody who's eligible to vote in this country uh, to vote and whatever candidate you support, it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned, because if we get everybody who's eligible to vote, we'll make Donald Trump a one term president. And that's what we need to do. Um, I might say just a word about myself. I, uh, I was born in New Delhi, India. That's not um, uh, necessarily a crowd pleaser everywhere I go and in, in, uh, in my travels, but I was there because my, my father and my mother were working for our State Department at the time. Um, as part of uh, JFK's effort to, tr to try to uh, demonstrate to the rest of the world the importance of um, our democracy and, and democracy as a, as a way of organizing uh, other humans. Um, when I was in second grade, I was asked to line up in my classroom uh, with my classmates from wh whose family had been in the country most recently and whose family had been in the country the longest. I was the answer to both of those questions because my father's family went back to the Mayflower, although the people that came over on the Mayflower that I was related to died the first winter they were here, but they had a son that they that um, uh, came after them about 20 years uh, after them to the U.S. And my wife, uh, or my mother, was a Polish Jew who survived the Holocaust with her parents. They were the only ones that survived with an aunt. They went to uh, Helsinki for a year after living in Warsaw, two years after the war. Then they went to Mexico City and then they came to the only country in the world where they felt they could rebuild their shattered lives, uh, the United States of America. Recently in his anti-immigrant fervor, Donald Trump has actually tried to make it harder for people like me to become citizens of this country, um, uh, sending uh, regulatory advice that people born abroad should have to go through much more onerous proceedings than the ones that I went through. I have in my office the diplomatic passport that has my picture uh, uh, naked in a bathtub in, uh, in New Delhi. And the other day I actually got from Holy Family Hospital in New Delhi. They, they sent it to me. I, uh, I didn't ask for it. A copy of the record of my birth there, which I'm very happy to, to have. Uh, my mother, I suppose, more detailed than you need. My mother said that um, the doctor who delivered me was both um, a Muslim and a communist, and that the embassy was worried about it at the time. She seemed to get the job done, and, and she was a she, the doctor. 
Um, I think it's critical that we beat Donald Trump. And I'd say that uh, as a senator, but also as a father of three daughters and somebody who was once the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. If I had to summarize the last 10 years of town halls that I've had in Colorado, it's people coming there and saying, we're working really hard, but we can't afford some combination of housing, healthcare, higher education or early childhood education. In other words, we can't afford a middle-class life in one of the most dynamic economies that we have in America. If I think about the parents of the kids I used to work for uh, in the Denver public schools, most of whom are kids of color, most of whom are kids living uh, in poverty, um, what they would say to me is, um, we're working really hard, but no matter what we do, we can't get our kids out of poverty. And that is a reflection of an economy that for 50 years uh, has benefited only the people uh, at the very top and has basically left everybody else in the country behind, which I think is a reason Trump was elected to begin with. Uh, it's ironic because he doesn't care about your kids or my kids or the kids that I used to work for in the Denver public schools. And I think we need a president who's focused essentially on two things. One is ensuring that we're not the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity, not more, to the people coming after us. If we have 10 more years of the politics, like the politics we've had in Washington over the past 10 years, we will be that generation. And we've got to restore America's place in the world. And um, every day we see the damage that's been done by having Trump as our president. Last weekend alone, you know, you look at the stuff that he spent the whole weekend tweeting and and I'm in a law firm in Washington right now. If, if, you, if, if somebody in this law firm had spent the weekend doing what Trump had done, uh, they'd be meeting with HR on Monday morning and that the human resources department would be saying, you know, you better stop doing that because um, uh, uh, we're gonna fire you if you don't. And if the answer from the employee was, don't worry about it, I'm a stable genius. I have unmatched wisdom. That would be it for them, it'd be done. But unfortunately, He's president of the United States. So what was happening that weekend was Iran was doubling the number of centrifuges that they're using to enrich uranium. And China was signing a trade agreement with enough uh, countries that it all added up to half the, half the GDP uh, in the globe. So this is a serious matter that we're confronting. And um, our kids are suffering huge opportunity costs from having this guy present. But we're also discovering every single day what a world looks like with a vacuum of, of American leadership. And so I'm, I, that's the reason I'm running for president. I hope that I can earn your support and you can go to democratsabroad.org slash Bennett uh, to sign up or to find out more information. And with that, I'm delighted to have the chance to answer your questions. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. That's a great introduction. And you know, it's a, a great story about um, how you were born in, in New Delhi. You are a, a Democrats Abroad alum, so welcome to the organization. I'll take it. I'll take, I gotta find the t-shirt. Oh, that we will send, one, send you one, that would be fun. So our first question is on a topic that we all care very deeply about. And um, Katie, would you like to ask it? And Katie, you wanna introduce yourself as a Colorado voter? Oh, you're on mute, wait one second. I'm gonna unmute you, there you go. Thanks, hi Senator Bennett, I'm uh, living in Germany, but I've been a, Pueblo, Colorado voter for about 15 years. Oh. Until recently, sorry, I had to change to Arizona, but I, I liked oh. being one of your constituents. Well, we liked having you and we'll take you back anytime you want to come. Thanks. This question comes from our Hispanic Caucus and our Progressive Caucus. The climate crisis is a significant contributing factor to many conflicts and refugee situations around the globe putting Americans abroad and all global citizens at risk due to political insecurity. How will you ensure that the U.S. will reduce greenhouse gas emissions below Paris Accord targets and lead the global, sorry, global effort to avoid catastro catastrophic climate breakdown and the global insecurity that it would cause? Thank you very much for the question. This is, I would say, easily in the top three issues that I hear about over and over and over again in Iowa and New Hampshire. So I appreciate the chance to answer it. The first plan that I put out was a climate plan. I could have put out an education plan or something else, but the reason I put out the climate plan is because of the existential nature of the threat and the fact that the next generation has so little to thank us for as it is. The one thing they're really gonna be upset about is if we don't deal with this because they feel like 
they will be out of time and incapable of dealing with it if we don't address it. Um, in my plan, I said that in the first 100 days of my administration, I would convene uh, uh, the gl global leaders in Denver, Colorado, to figure out how together we would actually improve the targets in, in Paris and make them more aggressive. Um, I would join the Paris Agreement, and I have laid out what would be in my um, climate legislation, which would include um, uh, dramatically reducing the um, emissions by 50% of our, of our transportation sector by 2030, uh, dramatically reducing the emissions of our built environment also by 2030, um, setting the United States as a part uh, and as a leader in the world by setting aside 30% of our lands for the sequester of carbon. You know, we, we are living in a country where we've got a lot of agriculture and I believe we can pay farmers and ranchers to sequester carbon in their soil, which has the benefit not just of um, uh, dealing with climate change, but building a new constituency to support uh, climate change legislation. And I just want to say one thing about that. It is fight, and, and by the way, there is a worldwide uh, effort out there to set aside 30% of the globe for the same purpose. Um, Tom Udall and I in the, in the U.S. Senate have, have the legislation to do that here. I often hear on the trail that um, it's important for us to act urgently on climate change, and I believe that. I've said in the, in, if Congress doesn't pass the legislation I propose, in the first nine months that I'll use every executive power available to the president uh, under the Clean Air Act to deal with climate change. But it's really important to understand that urgency is not enough. We have to create a solution that will endure for a generation. And that's why we can't accept the rubble of our democratic institutions. Mitch McConnell can, Donald Trump can, because they're not trying to actually accomplish anything except put right-wing judges on the courts and occasionally cut taxes for rich people. If you want to really address climate as a democracy, um, we need to have an American climate plan like we once had an American foreign policy where every president knew what their job was with respect to the Soviet Union or their job was in the Cold War or with the Atlantic Alliance. And we are a long way from having that kind of politics in Washington. This is another reason that I'm running. I don't accept this, this version of our democracy, because I think we will be reduced simply to writing press releases about climate and pretending that we're doing something about climate when our kids and our grandkids actually need us to do something real about it. That's going to require us to build a constituency for change outside of Washington that can close over a broken Washington. I think that's true on a whole range of issues, but it is no more true on any than it is uh, on climate. Well, thank you. That's a, a really excellent and interesting answer. Um, our next question is um, uh, on immigration. Amanda, do you want to ask it? Yes, thank you, Julia. And thank you, Senator, for joining us today. Uh, yes, this is a question on immigration, which concerns many of our members. Uh, executive orders such as the one exploiting the term public charge demonstrate that our current immigration system was founded in a shameful era of discrimination and bigotry and that family members of Americans abroad are allowed to enter the US through a patchwork of fragile band-aids and weakly defended interpretations. Would you restore the principle of family reunification? And how would you plan for immigration to improve the situation for spouses, partners, and relatives of Americans living abroad like us who wish to return with our families? Uh, I would uh, reinstitute family reuni reunification and that's, been a focus of my work in the last 10 years in the Senate. Um, and I appreciate very much you're asking the question because um, I, I actually think this is not a place where we have this latent anti-immigrant view of uh, the world. I think this has been stoked by an irresponsible politician named Donald Trump who has used immigration to divide the country to get elected. He's trying to divide the country again to be reelected and we can't let that happen. Um, it also has been stoked by Fox News, who throughout the entire election season and since then has been running anti-immigrant propaganda on their network uh, and to their everlasting shame by the Republican National Committee. I was part of the Gang of Eight in 2013 who wrote the immigration bill in the Senate. We had four Democrats and four Republicans um, who wrote a piece of legislation that created a pathway for citizenship 
uh, for the 11 million people that are here that are undocumented, had the most progressive DREAM Act that had ever been written, and something that Donald Trump has completely forgotten, had $46 billion of border security, not $6 billion for his medieval wall that Mexico was supposed to pay for, but 21st century border security. So we can see everybody who's um, coming across the border, and we can understand who came lawfully and overstayed their visas and what we want to do about that. Throughout that entire negotiation, uh, family reunification was at the top of the Democrats' list. It was at the top of my list. It continues to be. And even in the short term, <clears throat> uh, before the presidential election, if there are things I can do for anybody or anybody's family on family reunification, I hope you'll let me know. I could put every single member of my staff on immigration issues and they would be busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week because of what this administration has wrought. Um, and, but so we're happy to add a few more cases. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's, that's amazing. And um, we will definitely be back in touch about that. And it would be great to talk to your staff on these issues. Here's another question that's a, a hot topic for many on the call today. Our task, taxation task force drafted it. Um, and it's about regulatory guidance from the Treasury Department and how, you know, if we just got some that could alleviate the harms of FATCA, which are, is suffered by thousands of Americans living and working abroad, would you commit to direct the Treasury Department to study and then implement new guidance that provides relief to ordinary Americans living abroad who are demonstrably not evading taxes? I would. I absolutely would. And I support the just the idea of a commission that I think Congresswoman Maloney has had in the House for a while uh, to begin to do, take a look at that work. I think it's important for us to raise it. And I think your advocacy on this issue is very important because nobody else is going to advocate for this position. Um, you should not be treated like you're a bunch of money launderers just because you're living abroad. You should be able to uh, not be suffered double taxation, and you should be able to op open a bank account without uh, people accusing you of doing something illicit. So the answer to your question is yes. Well, fantastic. I know lots of people will be listening very c carefully to hear that answer. We have one more taxation question. Uh, go ahead, Amanda. You want to ask it? Yeah, thank you. And that's really great to hear, Senator. Um, as a follow-up, most Americans living abroad think that the time has come for residency-based taxation, the principle guiding all other countries' tax system, and a fix for numerous unjust burdens on Americans living and working abroad. There are bipartisan, revenue-neutral proposals to implement RBT that include robust provisions to protect the law from abuse by tax evaders. All we need is a moment of leadership to get this done. Will you be that leader? I will be glad. I've not had a chance to study it in the detail that I would want to before I give you an answer that is definitive. But I think um, the substance of what you're talking about is aligned with the way I view the world. I do not believe you should be suffered to double, double taxation. I do not believe it makes any sense that I think we're only one of two countries in the world that don't have an RBT regime. So let me take a deeper dive and give you a, uh, an, a, a, an answer. And I hope in the answer itself, um, it's reflecting the, that I really want to be the leader you need, which is somebody who's not going to lie to you or shoot their mouth off, but is actually going to understand what they're grappling with. And I'll take a look at it and get back to you guys. I'm sure that the answer is going to be yes. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that's amazing. And um, we totally understand that it's something that you do have to kind of study and look into. And, you know, again, for us, it's all about being revenue neutral. We don't, we, we understand that's very important. Katie, would you like to ask the next question? Katie, go ahead. Wait, we need to unmute you, Katie. There you go. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Or let me, there you go. Okay, we have found the mute, the mute button. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bennett, this question is on health care. In a 2019 survey of Americans living abroad, many Democrats abroad members cited their reason for living abroad as affordable health care. These numbers include health care refugees who cannot, who cannot afford to return to live in the U.S. due to the high cost of health care and the threat of bankruptcy due to illness. Under your health care plan, will Americans currently abroad at all income levels and all in all states of health 
be able to return to live in the US and receive quality, affordable, accessible health care for their families at a reasonable cost and without the threat of bankruptcy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that critical question. First of all, I was at a town hall meeting the other day and a woman came up to me after it was over and said, my kids are all living abroad and I can't get any of them to move back to the United States. I said, why is that? And she said, because of healthcare, because the cost of college is so much cheaper overseas than it is abroad. These are the kinds of things that are doing huge damage to our country, not because it's impossible to figure out, <laughs> that's embarrassing, I apologize. Not because it's impossible oh, to figure how to do it, but because our political system is so freaking broken. And um, this is not a time for cheap promises, which are only going to make people cynical and, and hate the, you know, our politics even more. And on healthcare, for the last 10 years, I fought uh, for a public option. I believe that uh, Obamacare was incomplete without the public option. I, I led the fight for it when we passed it. <coughs> I seem to be having my own healthcare issues as we speak. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think it's critically important. You ask the question, people of all income levels. I mean, there are millions of Americans who are making too much money to be on Medicaid, but not enough money to afford private insurance. Public option is a perfect answer for them. And I believe in three years, we could have universal coverage achieved with a public option, auto enrolling everybody who's eligible into Medicaid and every kid that's eligible into CHIP, which is the kids Ch uh, child in insurance program for poor kids, and we'd be done with the coverage issue. But your question actually points to what's fundamentally much more important, which is cost. Our country spends twice as much as what any other industrialized country in the world spends on health care. We're the only country where, as you point out, families go bankrupt, where seniors have to make decisions about buying drugs or buying their groceries. And this all has to stop. We need the federal government to negotiate drug prices. Nobody in America should pay higher drug prices than anybody in the rest of the world pays for drugs. And we've got to create incentives and disincentives in our healthcare system so we drive the cost down um, and frankly improve the quality as well. And I don't think much of the democratic debate so far is really focused on any of that. It's just focused on the coverage question. I will leave you with this thought. I think that if Democrats run on Medicare for all, we will lose the presidency to Donald Trump. And I mean that. Um, the idea that we're going to propose to the American people that we're going to take away their choice to buy either private insurance if they want it or a public option, which is what I propose, for the privilege of paying $31 trillion in new taxes, which is equivalent to 70% of all the revenue the federal government will collect over the next 10 years, is a dead bang loser. And we should not be for that. We should be for universal health care. We should be for cutting costs. And we should be for preserving quality. And I think my plan is the best one to do that. Well, thanks so much. That's really interesting. And I hope that um, those constituents who are abroad, they know about Democrats abroad. When you, when you told us that story, we we're all like, okay, some more potential voters there. Right, right. We, we have one more question for you. Um, it's about voter protection. And while federal legislation provides some protection for overseas voters, this legislation does not go very far, um, and it def definitely doesn't go far enough to counter the challenges that states and recently the Trump administration have set up to limit voting from abroad. Right now, 67% of all abroad uh, ballots are returned by postal mail, basically due to state requirements, yet postal delivery of ballots is just, full, there are just so many problems involved with this. And during each election, thousands of ballots do not arrive on time to be counted. How would you help protect the rights of Americans abroad to vote while helping states ensure that ballots are returned safely? Um, the, the, the right to vote is under assault in our country. If you had told me when I was graduating from college in 1987 that in 2019 we'd be facing the kind of interference with people's right to vote, I would have said that's impossible. But, but it is happening all over America. And by the way, it happened in our last election because of the Russian interference. They, they, they spent a, a tremendous amount of time trying to uh, reduce the African-American vote all over the United States through social media propaganda, and we need to be alert to that as well. Uh, I am for uh, making it easier for people to vote in any way that we can, um, including uh, you guys, if there are 
or ideas about how to use the internet to do that or other kinds of things, I'm interested and open to those ideas. Um, in our state, we've got um, mail-in ballots, but you have three weeks to return them. And, uh, and, and, and you can return them in all kinds of different ways. And the result of that is that Colorado has the second highest voter particip participation rate of any state uh, in the country. And it's made a difference in our policies because I think the more people that vote, the more opportunity there is to enact progressive policies around climate, around immigration, around the economy. And, and that's why it's so vital for us to make sure that every single vote counts. And, and it's why I'll sort of end here again by saying what I said at the beginning, which is I would love your support. And if you go to democratsabroad.org slash Bennett, you can find me there. But if you don't support me, I just want to say again, everything you can do to make sure that every single person who's abroad votes and your family back here uh, votes uh, is really what we have to do to beat Donald Trump. And, it, and we can't take it for granted. Well, thank you so much, Senator, and we totally agree with you. We are so committed to getting out the vote. And I do, I do want to mention that Colorado is a fantastic state to vote abroad um, in. We, we love your, your policies. Thank, thank you so you. much for that. We, it's really great. So uh, thank, thanks again, and um, we, we are so appreciative of your time, and thank you for letting us dig into a few of the questions we deeply care about. But before we sign off, I just want to remind everyone in the audience that Senator Bennett's petition is on the Democrats Abroad website at www.democratsabroad.org slash Bennett. That's www.democratsabroad.org slash Bennett. And um, Senator, is there any last thing you'd like to add? Any, I would one, say just one more? please, please, please sign the petition so I can be on the ballot. And we are I'm not polling uh, in, the, in the lead right now. That's certainly true. But there, I don't think the leading candidates are actually going to win this nomination. I believe somebody is going to come out of the group of people that are trading somewhere uh, in the one to three range today. I hope to be that person. Uh, and I look forward to meeting all of you uh, down the road. Thank you for representing our country so well. Well, thanks again, Senator, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. We look forward to seeing you in future candidate calls and at our primary next spring. I hope you all have enjoyed our global town hall with the Senator as much as I did. Uh, your support goes a long way. Please visit democratsabroad.org slash Bennett uh, slash donate so that we can continue to bring more events like these to Americans around the world. We'd also love to have your support as a volunteer. Next year, it's going to be all hands on deck. So sign up at democratsabroad.org slash volunteer to get involved. New first time volunteers are very welcome. With that, we're going to be ending the call. So thanks again to Senator Benish and to all of you for joining the Global Town Hall today. So everybody, thanks so much.